So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this morning. This is a series of talks that uh, Jani and, and Bev in particular have been supporting uh, over the past year. And uh, we are basically building on some content that was created for the Canadian Paint Society last year. And uh, uh, Akwasi, um, Daniel, as well as Carmen Green were the speakers at that time. And we went through some of this con content in the context of its relation to chronic pain. Uh, it was the best attended uh, webinar of the year uh, with well over 120 um, uh, attendees. And so when Bev approached me to put this together, I, I quickly approached uh, these uh, you know, highly requested speakers to put this together for you. So we're going to be focused on confronting the roots of anti-Black racism in society and medicine. And I will, what I plan to do is present um, each speaker as they uh, take over the screen. Uh, the first speaker that we'll have this morning is Akwasi Owusu Bempa, and I'm going to ask Akwasi to take over the screen. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Akwasi. Uh, he's a professor at the Department of Sociology at the University of Toronto and a senior fellow at Massey College. He's trained, he's a trained criminologist. Uh, professor Bempa's uh, research focuses on racial and other forms of inequity in the context of law, criminal justice, and social policy. And Akwasi I've known for some time now, and he's a you know, very humble guy, but uh, he forgot to mention or send to me that he recently won at the University of Toronto President's Impact Award for his work with all levels of government, including the Senate, the House of Commons, standing committees, provincial legislative bodies, and municipal advisory panels. His research and writing have been used to advance judicial education and the education of both the Crown and defense bars. He's a co-authored expert report uh, in the trial of R versus Morris, which led to significant evolution in the way Black offenders are sentenced in our Ontario courts. So with that as a context, Akwasi, I'm going to hand it over to you and uh, please take it away. Dr. Clark, thank you for the uh, introduction and of course the invitation to be with folks this morning. Um, I have no disclosures, nothing to declare in the context of this uh, conversation, uh, this talk. I am happy to be here. So I'm a criminologist. Uh, I study inequality in the criminal justice system as noted, uh, primarily uh, examining issues related to race and policing. Um, understanding why black men experience disproportionate levels of, uh, of violence at the hands of the police has led me to consider the role of history in shaping how we perceive black people generally and black men in particular. Um, I'll begin to connect the treatment that black men uh, and the violence that they receive at the hands of the police, which is of course the topic of much discussion at the moment, um, to inequities in dealing with uh, pain that we observe in the context of medicine and healthcare. Uh, connecting what I see in the streets in the context of my work to what you may see in, in your work and perhaps your own personal experiences. So we're talking about inequities and pain. Again, there's been a lot of attention to issues of racial injustice, largely prompted by um, the policing of black and indigenous people. Here we can see some images of the most high profile recipients of police use of force. On the left, uh, Mike Brown, the young man who was killed uh, by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, which sparked uh, protest demonstrations in 2014. In the center, Eric Garner, a man who was uh, strangled to death by the NYPD uh, for selling um, loose cigarettes. And of course, on the right-hand side, uh, George Floyd and uh, Derek Chauvin here, George Floyd's death, of course, prompting the unrest and uh, discussions that have taken place over the past year. Now, in order to uh, understand uh, the mistreatment of uh, Black people generally, and, and I would extend this to Indigenous populations as well in the context of not only policing but broader society, we need to have an understanding of the emergence of race as a concept itself. And this is something, and especially in the context of the talks that I do, that uh, many people are unfamiliar with. So as a sociologist, I see race as a social construct, right? Uh, a product of a process we call racialization. And as Europeans began exploring and discovering the world, and as the Enlightenment took hold, uh, European scientists and philosophers uh, also began, of course, to classify uh, the natural world, plants and animals alike, and they did the same with human beings. Here we can see some early uh, depictions of how scientists of the day separated the races based on physical characteristics, uh, in this case, skull shape. Uh, Joan and Frederick Blooming box on the natural variety of mankind, uh, published in 19, uh, 1795, pardon me, uh, with images from the text depicted on the left was hugely influential. And you can see the beginning of our racial classification schemes, right? And what's important to note is that these racial class uh, categorizations that we use today, black, white, Asian, for example, are a product of our recent, recent history. They certainly did not always exist. 
As uh, NPR drawing on the work of David Livingstone Smith has noted, uh, Sub-Saharan Africans and Native Americans were denizens of the bottom of the human category uh, when they were even granted human status at all. Uh, mostly they were seen as soulless animals and this had a dramatic uh, dehumanization effect. It was dehumanization that made possible the great atrocities that took place. Uh, in the context of black people, of course, uh, this uh, would be in reference to slavery. According to enlightenment, princ enlightenment principles, pardon me, uh, human beings could not be held as slaves. And so in order to be held as property, uh, black people were quite literally seen as less than human or dehumanized. So the concept of dehumanization here is crucially important. Uh, dehumanization describes the process through which humanness is denied to an individual or a collective group. And, this concept is often employed in the context of genocide and ethnic conflict and often involves the association with a, a group of, of people with animals or animalistic tendencies. The Nazis, of course, de dehumanized the Jews by referring to them as rats. The Hutus involved in the Rwandan genocide calls it, called the Tutsis cockroaches. Now, dehumanization is considered a prerequisite to mass uh, slaughter or harm. And the dehumanized group falls outside of what Fain describes as uh, the universe of obligation those uh, who must be taken into account and to whom obligations are due. The dehumanized no longer elicit compassion or other moral responses. Now dehumanization is key in the context of black populations and their experiences with violence. Uh, despite the fact that systemic dehumanization of black people largely took place in the West centuries ago, the legacy of that thought lingers. In a series of, uh, in a series of uh, insightful studies, uh, Phil Goff and colleagues, including MacArthur Genius uh, Prize Award winning Jennifer Eberhardt, tested the implicit association between black people and apes uh, and examined the implications for this association in criminal justice terms. And what they found was a mental association still exists today um, and remains strong amongst white Americans. And they demonstrate how this association influences both cognitive processes and judgment assessments. So specifically, uh, the research shows that an implicit black ape association leads to greater endorsement of police violence against black, black suspects, pardon me, and influences state decisions to execute black convicts. And in a second series of studies, Goff and colleagues built upon this work um, to test the consequences of dehumanization uh, in, to the extension of other social protections, namely the affordance of innocence to children. And drawing on both lab and field studies, uh, they found that black children are misperceived as older relative to children and other, of other races and more culpable for their actions. Importantly, when Goff and colleagues matched this, these impli implicit bias tests conducted with officers in the lab to their field um, reports on use of force, they found that the more officers implicitly associated black people with apes in the laboratory setting, the more likely they were to have used force against them uh, in the streets. So they illustrate not only the persistence of the dehumanization of black people, but also the consequences in real world settings. Now, for those who question the continued connection between um, black people and apes, uh, or the you know, importance of and relevance of dehumanization, uh, we can see here a couple of images. On the left-hand side, uh, the cover of a Belgian newspaper in 2014. Um, and on the right, an image obtained uh, during the investigation into the Ferguson Police Department. And here we can see, you know, the most powerful man in, in the world at the time being de depicted in dehumanized terms. Now, in addition to dehumanization, there's also a long history of the superhumanization of Black people, uh, going back as well to slavery. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, physicians characterized Black people as having magical bodies that were able to withstand pain and surgical pr procedures without anesthetics. Uh, black people are portrayed today as super, superhuman quite often in the media, especially in the context of sports. Here we see clearly LeBron James being depicted in uh, both dehumanized and superhumanized terms. Now, as a result, many lay people, scientists and scholars continue to believe that black, uh, the black body is biologically and fundamentally different from the white body, and that race is a fixed marker, marker of group membership rooted in biology. As Hoffman and colleagues note, many people insist that black people are better athletes, stronger, faster, and more agile. And as a result of natural selection and deliberate breeding practices uh, that took place during slavery. 
Uh, research suggests that people even believe that black people are more likely than white people to uh, be capable of fantastical mental and physical feats, such as withstanding extreme heat from burning coals. Now, Hoffman and colleagues have also conducted a series of related studies on public perceptions of black superhumanization. And in, in a recent study, they presented black and white faces to participants and asked them to decide which of the two individuals was more likely to have superhuman or supernatural powers, such as being, a, being uh, more likely to uh, have superhuman skin that's thick enough that it can withstand the pain of burning coals, more capable of using their supernatural powers to suppress hunger, hunger or thirst, uh, is more capable of surviving a fall from an airplane without breaking a bone through supernatural powers or having supernatural quickness that makes them capable of running faster than a jet. On each of these questions, respondents were more likely to choose black than a, uh, a black than a white face. Now, bringing this back to where we started, uh, here's a quote from Officer Darren Wilson's testimony uh, to a grand jury in relation to the shooting of Michael Brown. Again, Michael Brown being the young black man who was killed in Ferguson. Uh, Wilson stated, the only way I can describe it is I felt like a five-year-old holding on to Hulk Hogan. And it's worth noting that Wilson's six foot four and 210 pounds, Brown's an inch taller, or was an inch taller at six foot five, weighing 290 pounds. So we can see both dehumanization and superhumanization have a great grave impact on how people or black people are treated by law enforcement. Uh, and the general public alike. Uh, these phenomena continue to negatively influence the perceptions of Black people, seeing them as less deserving of compassion and care, more able to withstand pain and physical force. And as my colleagues will now do, uh, they will connect what uh, these phenomena, what I see in the streets and what the research demonstrates to what you may see in the doctor's offices, operating rooms and the likes. Thank you. Thanks for launching us, Sikwasi. Uh, that was uh, a nice introduction to the, to the social uh, uh, sociological context to some of the things we're going to continue to talk about. In it. And so I think it's a perfect segue and uh, I'll ask Daniel to take over his screen and uh, give you a brief introduction about Dr. Daniel Buckman. So unfortunate I lost Daniel as a colleague at UHN. He's now uh, moved on to uh, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. He's also an assistant professor in the Dalai Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto a member of the University of Toronto Joint Centre for Bioethics and an affiliate scientist in the Kremble Research uh, Institute of the University Health Network. Dr. Buckman's program of research explores ethical issues at the intersection of clinical practice and public health. His primary areas of research interest include ethical issues related to mental health, substance abuse, and chronic pain. Themes related to stigma, identity, moral responsibility, and compassion feature prominently in his work, and he, is a long -standing teaching, he has a long-standing teaching interest in empirical approaches to bioethics. Some of Dr. Buckman's current research interests are in the areas of uh, uh, machine learning, big data and mental health, neuroethics, and psychedelic assisted mental health care. Please uh, take it over, Dr. Buckman. Uh, you're on mute, Daniel. Daniel, you're on, you're on mute. You think like after this amount of time into the pandemic, I would figure this out by now. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Clark, uh, for the invitation. I'm really grateful to be here and particularly grateful to be able to um, present alongside uh, Dr. Wusu Bempa and um, Dr. Roberta Timothy. So today I'm gonna provide a very brief perspective from bioethics. I work as both a clinical ethicist uh, in a academic health sciences center at CAMH and as well as an academic ethicist. I think what's uh, known to this audience for sure is you know that hundreds of millions of people worldwide experience chronic pain. Um, you know, in Canada, we often cite a one in four statistic. Prevalence rates of pain vary across uh, racial category, ethnicity, class, and gender. However, the very populations who bear the greatest burden of chronic pain, so women, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and the poor, often receive the least care and the worst quality of care when they do. And so I see this as a matter of justice uh, and a matter of ethics. And I'll also, you know, argue today that this is no accident. Um, in this presentation, I'll argue that one can actually not discuss the ethics of contemporary chronic pain management without understanding the understanding how deep the deeply racist 
engendered history of pain medicine shapes policy, clinical practice, and moral discussions about pain today. Um, I have received funding from CIHR um, for ethics and chronic pain uh, and substance use research, and I have no other financial conflicts of interest to declare. I think what's inherent to discussions about ethics and social inequalities in pain management is a discussion of stigma. Very briefly, stigma involves an othering. Um, it's what my colleague Daniel Goldberg sometimes uh, discusses as difference plus deviance. So a powerful in-group will, will often distinguish a less powerful out-group as different and then assigns a normative label of deviance. And as we heard um, very clearly from Dr. Wosubempa, um, dehumanization is very central to the stigma process. So, you know, it's very well established that chronic pain is highly stigmatized. Um, this is due in part uh, because chronic pain is invisible and subjective and is often refractory to objective assessment. It frustrates the processes we have in, in our contemporary biomedical context. So people with chronic pain are often accused of being lazy, often accused of exaggerating or lying about their pain. Um, people are also considered malingerers, right? Uh, we can't necessarily identify, um, you know, the sort of the marker of pain, if you will, um, in the same way we might be able to identify something in a blood test. And this is because biomedical culture focuses on curative models of disease and looking at ob identifying objective indicators of pathology. And so as a result, distrust in patient testimony is quite high. So healthcare practitioners might ask, you know, how do I know that this patient is telling the truth about their pain? Um, and so trust, uh, which is many consider as the moral foundation of the therapeutic relationship, um, but it's kind of flipped on its head in the context of pain management. So it's not necessarily whether the person in pain can trust their clinician, although that's definitely uh, important and relevant, but, it, but the clinician may also ask whether or not they can trust the patient. Um, and this is because clinicians may also have concerns about uh, patient testimony and the appropriate treatment that they're providing them that's going to like pr promote their, ben um, their welfare and their well-being and not harm them. But unfortunately as well, trust is a social good in society that is not distributed equally. Thereby, you know, it create, creates additional barriers for people to convince others that they actually have chronic pain. Um, and so people who hold additional identities along various axes of social inequality, so for example, due to racialized status, gender, or disability, have the added weight or burden of proving that they are a trustworthy person. person. So again, a ma matter of equity. So medicine with its uh, long uh, claims to science and epistemological authority, has a long history of promoting biological concepts of race and racial hierarchies to create hierarchies of value. And this is true for pain management. You know, as uh, Professor Owusu Bempa um, just explained previously, um, blacks were thought to have biologically superior nerves, which allowed them to have a very higher pain threshold. And this was used to help justify slavery. So the images uh, on your screen, um, which I'll explain in a moment, um, so one uh, uh, is rel uh, related to um, uh, J. Marion Sims, uh, and so if you look on the left of your screen, this is a very uh, famous picture of J. Marion Sims, who is considered to be the father of gynecology, and he performed countless experiments on enslaved women without anesthesia. But I think who is less remembered in this story um, are the mothers of modern gynecology. Uh, and so um, the woman that's depicted in the, um, in the image on your left is Anarka. Uh, and um, the other women that we do know from um, Sims's records, Betsy and Lucy, um, were also very, I mean, I would argue as central to the, um, uh, to the development of modern gynecology, who, the, who was uh, experimented on sort of horrifically um, uh, for, uh, on vaginal fistulas. The image on the right is actually a statue of Sims, uh, J. Marion Sims, who uh, was removed from Central Park in 2018. So there was a statue, you know, um, again, glorifying Sims and, and Sims's work, 
um, but uh, due to activism and advocacy and protest, um, given um, what Sims did to to slaves, um, this was this was taken taken down. I'm not going to explain uh, this study. This is uh, Dr. Wusu Bempa explained it uh, as well. But just you know, these the, just to really highlight the point that the notions of racial, what's called racial biological essentialism, um, persist to this day. But when the contemporary culture of pain management intersects with groups that already experience densely woven patterns of stigma and systematic disadvantage certain forms of disadvantage become intensified. And so this is uh, uh, found in a concept called epistemic injustice, which um, has a long history in, in black feminist thought, uh, as well as um, the uh, philosopher uh, Miranda Fricker's work. And epistemic injustice takes different forms, um, but essentially it's the idea that when someone, it's an, or it's an ethical and epistemic harm. So when someone is harmed, in their capacity as a knower or as a harmed in their capacity as a provider of information or giver of knowledge. So a hearer will deflate the credibility of a speaker. So if you think a hearer in this case is a healthcare professional and a speaker is a patient because of some um, prejudice, conscious or unconscious bias um, or, or racist uh, belief um, about the person. So they may be given less credibility than they ought to have had. So, you know, as mentioned, you know, epistemic injustice is very central to pain management. And in pain management is a context where, you know, we have distrust is already very high and people living with pain have to prove that they have pain um, such that their treatment is warranted. And this is additionally burdensome for certain populations such as women, um, gender diverse individuals and black and uh, indigenous people of color. Um, this is a study that came out recently looking at testimonial injustice, which is a form of epistemic injustice. And the objective of this study was to identify linguistic mechanisms by which physicians communicate disbelief of patients in medical records, and then to explore uh, also some of the racial and gender differences in the use of such language. So it wasn't looking at pain specifically, but just look how this uh, operates sort of in healthcare context. Um, you know, I won't, I won't go in, again, just in the rest of time into some of the details of this, but what they did is they, they used natural language processing um, to evaluate the prevalence of these features, of various features. So quotes um, that had to do around disbelief or specific judgment words that suggested doubt about their experience um, or what they called evidentials, which in, this, which in the particular sentence construction, which patients or symptoms of experiences reported as hearsay. And, um, you know, what they found was that uh, notes about black patients had higher odds of containing at least one quote and at least one judgment word and used more evidentials. Um, so it's compared to notes of white patients. And they've also found that notes of female patients versus male patients did not differ in terms of judgment words, um, but they also did have a higher odds of containing at least one quote. So we have the evidence here, but, but this is known, um, you know, this has been known for centuries, and this has been documented um, by folks for a very, very, very long time. And you know, when we see here the intersection of racism and and gender, um, this you know this this comes really comes to the fore. And so you know, we hear stories uh, from Black women. We hear stories from um, others that you know, um, if they when they present to healthcare professionals, um, if you know, they present as too calm, for example, um, they're not considered sick. Um, you know, however, if on the other end of the spectrum, if people present as crying and moaning, they're charged with um, exaggerating their symptoms. Um, you know, we know that this often happens for people uh, suffering and living with sickle cell disease, um, as well as many other uh, misunderstood conditions such as endometriosis and fibromyalgia. Um, but I want to bring it also at back at the end of my presentation here to my field, my discipline, um, bioethics, and and how my field has been very complicit in all of this as well. And so recently, uh, Dr. Keisha Ray, uh, bioethicist in Texas, um, levied a critique against bioethics 
um, in and what she argued for the development of a of a black bioethics. And she says that bioethics, you know, tends to focus on high tech issues, um, so high tech tech technologies and novel technologies, and less so on issues of social justice, racial justice, disability ethics, LGBTQS ethics, and topics that are specific to um, immigrants, Latinx populations, as well as black populations. And I, and I fully agree with her um, critique. Now, bioethics does tend to focus on so-called vulnerable populations in research, but um, less so on populations who are made vulnerable by various historical and institutional injustices. And so bioethics itself lacks a lot of diversity in the field and, and we need to do better. So just in summary, you know, a bioethics, a pain management, and many of the issues that I highlighted here today cannot be divorced from this social, cultural, political, and historical context. So we need to understand sort of how these ethical issues are come, created in the first place. Um, and this contemporary culture of pain management, as well as the social determinants of health, including stigma, as I would argue, is a social determinant of health in and of itself. And structural racism um, do produce these inequalities. And um, redressing these social inequalities requires, uh, in, my, in my view, structural changes. So there's just some references of my talk. And uh, thank you all so very much. Thanks very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, fantastic stuff. I'm going to invite uh, Roberta to now take over the screen. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to Roberta Timothy. Dr. Timothy is an assistant professor in the teaching stream and is the director of health promotion at the Dalai Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto and soon to be new Black Health lead in July actually of this year and an adjunct professor in, critically in critical disability studies at York University. She specializes in the areas of Black health, intersectionality, violence and ethics in health work, health and racism, art-based methodologies, trans, uh, transnational Indigenous health and anti-oppression, anti-colonial approaches to mental health. Dr. Timothy has worked for over 30 years in the community health, working on re resisting anti-Black racism and intersectional violence strategies. She's been living with a visual disability for over 20 years. So if you see the glasses, uh, that's part of it. I'll be reading and moderating her questions uh, and anything directed to her as they come in. And Dr. Timothy finally is also the co-founder and consultant of the Continuing Health Consultants, where she implements and teaches her intersectional mental health model, anti-oppression psychotherapy. She's an interdisciplinary scholar, health practitioner, and political scientist who examines global health and ethics from a critical trauma-informed decolonizing framework. And uh, Roberta, I, I presume you may not have slides this morning? Yes, thank you, Hans. I am gonna just uh, have a conversation with you with no slides. Fantastic. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for the invite. I would like to start with an ancestral acknowledgement. We honor our ancestors who are intrinsically linked to this land and who fought for their survival. Their lessons and sacrifices have led us to gather here today. We ask you to take a second to reflect and honor our ancestors, those who have now journeyed to provide the footprints in which we stand today. I also would like to read an Indigenous solidarity statement. I stand in solidarity with Indigenous peoples of these lands and support in their fight for reparations and self-determination, as I know that their struggles are intrinsically related to my own people's fight for justice and reparations, as we are linked through processes of genocide, white supremacy, colonization, and enslavement. I vow that even though we have differences amongst ourselves, that the divide and conquer supported, sustained, and fueled by the Canadian state, through systemic oppression maintained by colonial powers and white supremacist ideologies will not dictate or reconfigure my connection with indigenous African black and colonized peoples locally and globally. Um, in terms of locating myself, I identify as an African, African diasporic woman, woman as feminist, surviving African enslavement from a working class background, daughter of immigrants via the Caribbean and Latin America, mother of two living and resisting with a visual disability in Turtle Island, Canada. Uh, I've worked in the community health um, community for many years. I've worked as a therapist, as a counselor. Um, I've worked, my doctoral work is on Black women and violence against women, shelters and resistance education methodology. Um, I've also worked um, for criminal injustice, sorry, victim services and criminal injury board, um, providing mental health and anti-oppression training. Uh, I've conducted postdoc research on criminalization and HIV disclosure from a Black feminist intersectionality lens. So I want to locate myself in um, pain care, just quickly. I live with a corneal disorder for over 25 years. I have I've had two corneal transplants. I'm living and working with, the, with pain on a daily basis, dealing with the impact of anti-Black racism and ableism. I also am dealing with injuries from sports related to knee and earlier childhood development. My pain is often ignored, denied, or thought to be lessened. And healthcare professionals often respond to our pain differently. 
Um, I work with BIPOC clients who are dealing with chronic pain, often who are often denied and have to fight for specialists and other supports. Um, this conversation is going to explore the impact of oppression and racism on the healthcare of people living with pain and looking at intersectional factors. Uh, it's also the International Decade for People of African Descent, 2015 to 2024. I just want to bring that out because it's not necessarily being talked about. Um, I just want to give a quick definition of health equity. Health equity is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential. And no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. Health disparities or inequities are types of unfair health differences closely linked with social, economic, or environmental dis disadvantages that adversely affect groups of people. And this is from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I don't wanna quickly talk about intersectionality. It's a really critical um, a concept to understand or framework. Intersex intersectionality is the acknowledgement that everyone has their own unique experiences of discrimination and oppression. And we must consider everything and anything that can marginalize people, gender, race, class, sexual orientation, physical, physical ability, et cetera. Kimberly Crenshaw, a lawyer, coined the term in 1989. Um, we can talk about you know, five, 400 years of um, intersectionality in terms of looking at black feminism and just remembering Sojourner Truth, Ain't I a Woman, at the, 88, at, at the 1851 Women's Right Convention held in Akron, Ohio, which she talked about the importance of race, gender, and class. And of course, Cumberry River Co Collective Statement in 1974, a Black lesbian feminist collective who talked about race, class, gender, and um, how, it, how different types of oppression um, happen simultaneously for um, Black folks. We know that the numbers in, in terms of pain, one in four Canadians um, experience chronic pain. We also understand that this is a worldwide uh, phenomenon. I want to just quickly talk about understanding inequities in pain care and the needs to know uh, about health violence in Canada, a very brief overview. So we know Canada is a white settler colony that displaced Indigenous communities by utilizing anti-Indigenous racism and other acts of colonial violence, such as genocide in residential schools for over 400 years. The health disparities faced by Indigenous peoples are intrinsically linked to the nation building of Canada and to the continued experiences of unethical policies and governance related to the Indian Act and other colonial realities. Anti-Indigenous racism impacts the lives of Indigenous peoples and is, and is intrinsically related to anti-Black racism and other forms of intersectional violence. So we know that people of African ancestry in Canada have a history of colonial violence that started in villages throughout the African region as families were brutally torn apart, separated forever on the shores of African enslavement ports that through the Middle Passage and forced migration to the Caribbean, Latin, and South America, Europe, the United States, and Canada, to name a few, this made up the transatlantic slave trade. Black folks that survived were then bought as property and generations worked with no pay and with daily experiences of sexual, physical, mental, spiritual, and financial violence. The ethical practices of colonial violence in the lives of Black communities locally and globally are directly related to transgenerational trauma and health disparities which impact Black health today. So we know, uh, uh, we should know about Olivia Lejeune, a young black child from Madagascar was said to be the first enslaved African in Canada in the British colony in, in uh, 1680, 1632. And also it's really important to understand the Code Noir, which is an anti-black racist policy forcing baptisms and decreed the conversion of Catholicism of enslaved black people restricting rights and freedom. The Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 banned enslavements of African people. However, the ideologies, practices, and actions of intersectional colonial violence and anti-Black racism continue to impact the health of Black communities today. There was also a ban in 1867, 1867 to 1960s, a ban of African immigration to Canada. So when we look at the numbers of African people today, under 2 million, it's directly related to anti-Black racism policies. Um, just in terms of some key Canadian policies and practices that impact Black health. We know that um, the recent Bill C-45, the Cannabis Act, is really important to understand and the fight for uh, cannabis amnesty. The Canadian Mental Health Act, Children's Aid Society, criminal justice system, educational system, housing insecurity, food insecurity, HIV stigma, all of these are examples of um, anti-Black racist policies that impact health of Black folks. We also know that the number of police reported hate crimes motivated, motivated by race or ethnicity that Black folks are the most uh, people who have the, the largest numbers of uh, reported hate crimes, which is really interesting, uh, knowing that there, there is a, you know, a, the police brutality in terms of Black populations, so that we know that this number is actually really um, uh, under, underestimates the actual amounts of hate crimes towards Black people. Black people make up 2.9% of the Canadian population, but 8.6% of federal prisoners. Across Canada, 54% of Black women sentenced to federal prison are serving time for a drug offense. One fourth are foreign nationals. 
um, among, this is some statistics about black health realities. Among ethnic communities, black women have had the most drastic increase in rates of high blood pressure, increasing from 20% in 2001 to 27% in 2012. 24% of Black Ontarians qualify as quote unquote low income as compared to 14.4% of the general racialized Ontario population. In the Toronto District School Board, 69% of Black students graduated in 2011 as compared to 87% of racialized students and 84% of white students. 41% of all children and youth are in care apprehended by the Toronto Children's Aid Society are Black. Uh, in terms of COVID-19, Black people and other people of color make up 83% of reported COVID-19 cases in Toronto. So we know that before COVID-19, Black health disparities existed and that we know that it, that's intensified um, since uh, the pandemic. So 21% of reported cases affect Black people who make up only 9% of the city overall's population. And that's directly re related to anti-Black racism and anti-Black violence. We know that public health crisis, um, sorry, public health declared anti-Black racism a cri uh, crisis, a public health crisis. We knew that it was um, the ones who were working in and living. We knew that it was, but it, it happened. We also know that when we look at the Black Life Matters uh, movement in 2013 and looking at the protests that happened, uh, that folks were actually going to you know, protest during a, a pandemic, uh, talked about the, the impact of anti-Black racism and, and health violence. Um, in terms of pain in COVID-19, a study in Canadian Pain Task Force reported that uh, based on, on, this is October, 2020, uh, increased stress and mental health conditions um, occurred in terms of pain and COVID-19, increased disability, increased use of medications, increased disruptions to continuity of care, uh, potential actions which could improve care for people living with pain, was identify pain as a priority, support epi epidemiological work on pain prevalence, um, and other, other issues. I'm just mentioning that to look at when we're looking at what happens in terms of Black folks in pain. I just want to quickly talk about historical, uh, some examples of historical and ethical scientific experimentations. And this is directly related to anti-Black racism and health impact. So we know that enslaved African experiments, example, smallpox intercalation in a population of 850 enslaved Africans during the 1768 epidemic in Jamaica from British colonial rule. We know about the indigenous residential, residential school nutrition um, experiments and indigenous sanitarium survivors experiments. And we mentioned this because they're also related to, to similar experience in terms of African populations. We also need to talk about Shark Island concentration camp experiments in Namibia, which was then um, led to the Holocaust experience in Germany. And many folks don't know that that was one of the, the beginnings um, of uh, Nazi Germany was experimented in Namibia. Tuskegee syphilis trials in Alabama, 1932-1972. Guatemala syphilis experiments, Henrietta Lacks using her cells without permission, and institutionalizing um, and sterilization of people living with disabilities, to name a few. Um, my colleagues mentioned SIMS in terms of modern gynecology. I just want to mention a couple of more things. At the same time, uh, SIMS uh, enslaved, experiments on enslaved uh, children and enslaved women, uh, in 1851, drapetomania was a conjectural mental illness developed by American physician Samuel A. Cartwright who hypothesized the illness to cause enslaved Africans to flee captivity and their punishment being flogged whippings as a deterrent. So that's a really important one in terms of mental health impact um, and anti-Black racism, that it actually was a considered a, a psychological disorder to, to, to free captivity. I also want to mention the radiation of Black cancer patients, 1960 until 1971. Dr. Eugene St. Sejner, a radiologist at the University of Cincinnati, led an experiment exposing 88 cancer patients, poor and mostly black, to whole body radiation. A report in 1972 indicated that as many as of a quarter of the patients died of radiation poisoning. Um, so there is a directly, this directly relates to the notion of black people in pain in medicine and the studies that many medical professionals do not believe or give the same amount of pain relief to black folks. Percentage of white participants endorsing belief about biological difference between blacks and whites is also significant. That's the Hoffman study, which people know. I want to quickly talk about anti-black racism in health research um, and how it equals um, the lack of data and why it's critical to have race-based data. In a recent scoping review, researchers surveyed over 2,000 studies for information on cervical and breast cancer in black Canadians. Only 23 studies focused on these cancers in black Canadian women, and none of the studies, studies reported the incident, prevalence, or mortality rates of cervical cancer or, black, or breast cancer for this population. Uh, we know that researchers at McGill University in 2015 found, found that black women in Canada have substantially higher rates of premature births than white women, resembling the disparities in the United States. The study included um, that 91,045 live singleton births in Canada and just over 5 million live births in the US between May 2004 and May 2006. Um, the impact of oppression and racism on the healthcare of people living with pain is really important to understand. 
racial bias and discrimination have contributed and continue to contribute to inequities in pain experience and pain, and pain care for Black folks. Uh, there's many studies on uh, race and uh, pain experience in, in the Black community. Many of them are, are in the states. I just want to give you two. These, they're in the states because there's a bias in terms of um, collecting data in, in the Canadian context, and that's why a lot of um, Black health researchers are fighting to collect data uh, on Black health issues. So studies show that Black and Hispanic American patients report greater chronic pain, severity, but lower quality of care, which was talked about earlier. I'm not going to go through all of the studies, but there's, there's many studies. Um, also in terms of women, because we're talking about intersectionality, Black women and pain, we know that women are at greater risk than men of chronic pain diagnosis across their lifespan. So you can imagine when that happens, what that means for Black women. Uh, of course, in terms of statistics in the Canadian context, we don't have. In terms of LGBTQ and pain, we're also talking about intersectionality. So we know that there's a Black queer population. Uh, based on recent research finding, gender-based pain disparities also apply to gender diverse individuals and the LGBT community who experience greater prevalence of disability and marginalization than heterosexual individuals. We know that in, in terms of incarceration and pain, an investigation in con conducted by the Correctional Investigator of Canada found newly admitted inmates could be denied medication for 30 days or longer when waiting to be seen by physicians for longer than the common clinical guidance of 72 hours. Since there's such a high um, rate of incarceration amongst African and Indigenous peoples, um, how does these, these, these uh, anti-Black notions of, of pain also influence the, in terms of incarceration and pain? Uh, people living with chronic pain are also increased risk of number of concurrent conditions, including mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, et cetera. We also know that that's a, a big issue in terms of the Black community, the impact of anti-Black racism and, and chronic pain, and also not getting the, the services needed. So how intersectional factors such as gender and race can contribute to inequities in pain assessment and management increased pain. The, the result is increased pain for Black communities, increased isolation, and increased cost. I, I really just want to say two things because I know we have a short time. Um, the AMA, AMA um, American um, Medical Association, recently apologized for more than, a t more than 100 years, actively reinforced or passively accepted racial inequalities and inclusion of African American physicians. This hasn't happened in the Canadian context, but it would be great if it was done. In an address to the National Medical Association um, meeting, uh, they concluded that African Americans were, um, they talked about basically an apology for the anti-Black racism within the medical association. So addressing anti-Black racism in pain care um, through an anti-racist, anti-oppression framework will help to address the mental health impacts that increase pain and decrease access to care. And I have my, my last statement is um, how to be an active ally, um, how to be an anti-racist and anti-oppressive um, practitioner, how to decolonize your approach. Do your own work, decolonize oneself through unlearning oppressive ideologies and practice. Practices, actively searching out ways to reinvent, learn the importance of language, what you say has an impact, unlearn ways of communicating that dishonor or disrespect others, engage in empathetic listening and understand your power and your location, learn to be uncomfortable and to make mistakes, own guilt, act accountable, take responsibility for your unlearning, be clear about your positionality and framework, share your learnings based on your location and power, and walk the talk, act act actualize allyship strategically do no harm um, and no re-traumatization -traumatiza or do good. I am doing a current study 2020 to 2022 on Black Health Matters, National and Transnational COVID-19 Impact Resistance and Intervention Strategies Project. We have a national and international surveys in terms of the impact of COVID-19 anti-Black racism on the Black community. If you're interested, please check me out at, at blackhealthmatterscovid19.ca. Uh, I just want to end with this quote, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I, I am afraid. And that's from Audrey Lord. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Th Timothy. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say uh, everybody was exactly 15 minutes and it's 8.15. So that is uh, quite the feat. And I, and I appreciate that very much. So I have a couple questions, but I'm actually going to open it up uh, to the to the group uh, to see if there's any uh, questions from a, a, any of the audience. First, feel free to jump in. Uh, there's a hand up from Jenny. So thank you to everybody for your um, exceptional presentations and all of the work that you're doing. Um, this may be a thesis proposal in itself, but uh, building on Fricker's work. How can we diminish the gap between testimonial um, injustice and discounting someone's knowledge and uh, hermeneutical injustice, specifically not having the linguistic or 
epistemological structures within a biomedical framework to express um, knowledge and experiential learning, um, both of which are very restrictive, I guess, in each of our roles as patient and physicians. So I'm just wondering if you had any you, thoughts Daniel, on that. maybe? Does that one sound like it's coming at you? Sure, I can, I can attempt and then um, others please, please weigh in. Um, thank you, Jenny, for that um, fantastic question. And yes, I would agree, that's, that's a wonderful thesis topic. Um, so my, my attempt at, at responding um, right now um, sort of will be woefully insufficient given the time. Um, gosh, yeah, um, so how do we, so hermeneutical injustice uh, is, a, is, uh, is a form of epistemic injustice. Um, in which, uh, as Gianni mentioned, where there really isn't the language or within a particular community or society in terms of labeling the experiences. Um, so, you know, so on, on the one hand, I think um, I'll quickly say that one way to potentially bridge this issue is, um, I mean, we need to, I think listen to the language and stories and and terms and concepts and understand what people are living with these experiences, let's say in the chronic pain context, are using and and understand that language and understand where people are coming from and and sort of incorporate that language, even if it's not necessarily within a biomedical framework, into sort of our every our everyday clinical interactions. Um, you know, I think, you know, language evolves, um, you know, understanding and concepts and terms evolve. Um, and I think we need to think about, especially, you know, trying to bridge a testimonial hermeneutical gap um, in saying, hey, well, which language are we using in these interactions, these di dyads that are dominant? Uh, um, where are they coming from? Um, you know, how are, are we in some ways um, and I say we as sort of healthcare professionals, people in various positions of power um, who get to in some ways choose the language and concepts that people need to sort of fit into to understand their experiences. Because not everybody experiences, you know, their pain, let's say within a biomedical framework. Not everybody experiences their mental health or substance use within a biomedical framework, right? And so that's sort of the hegemonic language that ends up shaping the interactions and, and what issues are identified and experienced or are valued and going back to sort of this hierarchy of values thing. So in short, um, you know, I think we need to sort of, as healthcare professionals, be very attentive to that. And I know many people do in, in, in many respects, but really saying that, hey, you know, um, people are coming at their own experiences in very different ways. And and really, is there a way sort of to find and meet in that middle ground where di those different types of language and experiences can be sort of part of that shared framework? And people have been studying this for a long time and thinking about this for a long time. But I'm going to think more about your question, um, particularly from the epistemological sort of ethical stance. And, and, uh, and thank you for that. Thanks, guys. I'm actually going to move to Bev. I see she has her hand up. And uh, feel free to jump in here. Well, first of all, thank you very much on behalf of the department <clears throat> to Dr. Owusu Bempa, Dr. Buckham, Dr. Timothy, and also Dr. Clark for organizing these rounds. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I made a note in the chat that um, some folks couldn't be here because the operating rooms unexpectedly started earlier to deal with the surgical backlog. So we will record and thank you for allowing us to do that uh, so others can attend. Um, I have a question about uh, how Canada is um, must and needs to continue reframe its, its self-narrative. Uh, here we have the week where the Johnny McDonald st statue came down in, in Kingston. But this notion of inequity for certain groups, um, persistent longstanding, where it's kind of a trickle-down effect, um, but perhaps it's more intentional inequity, planned inequity, especially when we think about the needs of rural Canadians, uh, Indigenous populations. And just reframing that dialogue about of who's deserving, who gets what, and it's not just a trickle down effect, you know, serving the greatest masses and letting it percolate out to rural communities. Perhaps somebody might have some thoughts about, about that, that issue. I see Akwasi just unmuted, so why don't you jump in? Yeah, yeah, I'll just, just to start off, you know, I think uh, a broadened acknowledgement and um, recognition of 
the the nature of the inequality and, and having conversations like we're having now is greatly important. You know, I'm, I'm not shocked at all, but um, rather disheartened repeatedly when I do talks on inequality in the justice system. And I start with a historical perspective, just how few people recognize, you know, the mistreatment of Indigenous and Black populations in this country as we're starting to recognize more so. But, you know, to your point, the forces that led us to the inequities that we see now were purposeful, right? Like they were quite literally constructed. And so in order to reverse those, we need to be purposeful and intentional in addressing those inequalities. And as I've said, I think from my perspective, the first um, phase of that process is an acknowledgement, a full acknowledgement of our, the history of the mistreatment of indigenous populations, of black populations, you know, recognition of the impact that slavery and segregation had on black people, for example, in their position in society, and then taking a very, very deliberate approach. We've too long in this country, um, you know, tapped ourselves on the, patted ourselves on the back um, in comparison to the United States and, and, and you know, uh, misled ourselves to believe that we do not have uh, issues of racial inequality and other forms of inequality. And, you know, that certainly needs to change. Canada is a great country, I'm sure, as many of the people that are with us now and, and watching afterwards uh, will relate to, you know, many of us are highly mobile, but we choose to be in Canada for a reason. And it's great, but we have a lot of work to do. Uh, Roberta, any thoughts there? Um, I think just adding to the conversation about um, your framework and how you your individual practices can be a part of a, a larger uh, framework of you know practicing well like you know practicing from an anti-violence perspective um, but I would say decolonizing your practice so I think it's critical to to recognize the historical and current day um, experiences of violence you know within within Black Indigenous and intersectional communities and also look at your framework. Uh, to me, the biomedical model, which has a history of you know, anti-Black racism and other types of violence needs to be challenged in the work that we do as physicians, as therapists, as um, educators. And how to do that is really to start doing the work. Like you can use yourself as a tool to actually you know, change. And I think even in the rural context, you talked about, you mentioned rural context, there's a, there's a context of you know, what's happening in the, in the Indigenous community, um, communities in terms of uh, rural Canada, and also in terms of uh, for Black folks who are living in rural Canada, there's a lot of uh, increased uh, suicidality um, that's happening for Black youth in, in these areas also, and Indigenous um, communities. So I think it's it's about your framework. Ethically, practicing from an anti-racist, anti-oppression perspective is, act, is actually ethical. That's, that's what I would argue. And, and how to do that is critical to doing the change work that's needed to actually create wellness and health and healing in our communities. Uh, well said, Roberta. So there's just one, uh, we're, we're drawn to a close here, but uh, one, one topic that I, I know Akwazi and I have bantered back and forth about uh, over the years, and that is, and you highlighted it as well, Roberta, the lack of race-based data collection in, in our country. And uh, Akwazi, I know you have a take on that. So I'd like, to, I'd like you to share that with others just in terms of you know, how that has impacted some of these constructs. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think um, COVID-19 has, has brought to the forefront um, the need to collect uh, racially desegregated data on health, and I would argue social outcomes generally. Um, in the context of the criminal justice system, I've long been advocating for racially desegregated data, and there have been a couple of reasons why that's been shielded. Uh, and in other social sectors, uh, one for protection of stigmatized groups, you know, a concern around collecting that data, but I think also a sense of protectionism from institutions and from government, uh, and an acknowledgement that uh, when racially disaggregated data, whether it be in education, in criminal justice, employment, or health is released, it's going to demonstrate, you know, pretty clear racial disparities that will then need to be addressed. And so I think it is incumbent upon us, again, if we are to take an anti-racism, anti-oppression framework and to decolonize our work, that we have an understanding of how members of different groups uh, experience uh, different institutions and different sectors of our society. And, and, and again, all need to play a role in facilitating the appropriate collection and importantly, analysis and dissemination of that data. Thanks, Akwazi. And I think that's pretty clear in, in Canada has recently moved to a framework to start to collect some of this and it's been a long time coming. So let's hope that that will also lead to some greater identification. Can I just add one Absolutely, thing? Absolutely, Roberta, yep. I just also wanna add who collects the data and how the data is collected is really critical. Um, you know, collecting data for collecting data, we have a history of data being used problematic within the black community. So uh, researchers who have clear um, resisting anti-black racism 
um, frameworks are really important in terms of the research that we're doing now for COVID-19. The reason we're a, res a Black-led research team that is uh, collecting research in Canada and globally based on the, uh, pr the you know, uh, the practices of uh, data collection in our communities that have been problematic. So it's really how you're collecting and who, co who's, who collects it. And we're actually creating a database um, that can be used for many, you know, many years to come in terms of uh, intersectional and uh, uh, data that, that hopefully will support uh, changes within the health system, not just to collect and not make, not make those interventions that are needed. Thanks for that, Robert. I was sitting on a call last night with some of these Americans for the National Pain Ad Advocacy Center out of uh, Colorado, actually. And so uh, Sean Mackey was having a big discussion in terms of just, you know, pain related and, and disparity and race related data in the, in the US. And, you know, even though they collect this data, it's all about how the questions are being asked and, and how these things are put together. And so absolutely, uh, you know, you can ask questions multiple ways, as we see with a lot of our epidemiological studies, and get very different answers. And so absolutely important. So with the last three minutes, I do have a couple parting comments, but I think I'm going to give each of you maybe 30 seconds just, to, you know, to, to say final words, if, if you have any, and then I, I will wrap up the session with some thoughts from my end. So uh, Akwasi, would you like to lead, then Daniel, then Roberta? Sure, I guess my party message would be, would be clearly, you know, many of us have, have not uh, been made aware of, of some of the history that I've shared and, and the, the history of our Indigenous populations in this country. And I, I would say it's incumbent upon all of us to, um, to educate ourselves, right? And, and that's why I'm grateful that we have this session this morning and that I was invited. So thank you. Daniel? You're on mute still. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was just in process of unmuting. Um, I actually don't have much to add based on what's already been said. Um, I, you know, I think this has been, um, you know, I'm grateful for the invitation to be part of the conversation, um, to, um, you know, think about ways that um, this impacts my own work as a bioethicist and, and um, so the learning and unlearning um, for myself, but also the broader field of bioethics. Um, and uh, just, I'm grateful for the, for the panelists for their, for their insightful comments. Thanks, Daniel. Roberta. I just want to say it takes a minute to um, be an empathetic, empathetic, uh, anti, you know, violent practitioner, and how you treat your patients, even in that minute, can can make a, a change in terms of their their life and not actually create a re-traumatizing experience. Thanks, Roberta. So, you know, I, I sincerely want to thank each and every one of you for getting up way earlier than you probably would this morning on a Friday and joining uh, some of our anesthesiologists here. I'd like to thank Jenny and Bev for actually putting this together and attempting to have the entire community here, but I'm gonna leave you with some parting thoughts. And so, you know, as these rounds draw to a close, I can't let the moment pass. And I have to reflect upon some of the decisions made by some of the institutions this morning. You know, I read with great interest the multiple emails that have been drafted by our CEO over the past year regarding respect, regarding civility, regarding anti-racism, anti-black racism, anti-Asian racism. We just had a family run over uh, of, of Islamic faith by a car uh, not a few weeks ago. And I listened attentively last week at the Canadian Anesthesiology Society by uh, a message by our CEO that, that literally uh, talked about calling out when something's not right or there's been potentially an overt disrespect. And so what I would say, the decision this morning made by the leaders of various academic hospitals uh, to, uh, to not attend and start their hours at 8 a.m. needs to be called out. And one could argue that, yes, the reason that the OR started at 8 a.m. were due to surgical backlog. But, you know, over the past year, I've, I've noticed organizational needs uh, change OR times uh, at the drop of a hat for various reasons. And so I think, you know, what the decision this morning did was basically prevent in real time our anesthesia associates, our students, our trainees, and even some of my colleagues that may have wanted to participate and hear this in real live time, uh, the opportunity to do so. And so what I would say, you know, with that being said, I'm going to bid you all fantastic summers. We're going to rejoin with these rounds later on uh, in the fall. And I can only hope that at some point in time, you know, when my children will be presenting and talking about these uh, topics in the years ahead, that the cultural domination that continues to occur silently in our Canadian healthcare institutions come to an end. So with that, I'll bid everyone uh, a close to this and uh, thank everyone for those who were able to participate this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans. Hans, you know, I keep calling it Hans. Wonderful. Really appreciate your last comments. Thanks, everyone, again. Have a great weekend. Okay.